Hello, everyone, and good evening. It is a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all here this afternoon at this lecture and ceremony. Uh, this is part of the celebration of the 150th anniversary uh, since the foundation of our university. Kafoskari was established uh, in 1868 as a school of advanced studies uh, in economics, first in Italy, and since then has uh, gained itself an international renowned reputation in the discipline of his its history, economics and management, modern languages, uh, and the humanities. With the recent investments in uh, cutting-edge research uh, in science and technology, we have nowadays we are nowadays acknowledged as and regularly ranked amongst the top universities in Italy. So, an anniversary like this one is naturally an occasion to uh, tribute uh, and honor to the past, to the founding fathers and those who have paved the way so far. But in, in addition to that, uh, we have chosen to set the agenda of the celebrations as an occasion to look forward and steer our plans for the future towards the vision that we have of Kafoskari as a, center, as a center of outstanding research and education and as home for young, talented students, researchers, and scholars. So with that vision in mind, Looking forward, uh, as part of these celebrations, we have launched this initiative, this is part of this initiative, the Nobel School Lecture Series, with which we intend to bring to Kafoskari outstanding scholars, truly outstanding figures and scholars, uh, to welcome them in our university, uh, making them part of the academic life and community, be in touch with the students, and be a source of inspiration and motivation for all of us and ask them, well, and have them naturally um, bring and add enormous added value to the learning and research experience we have uh, here and we offer to our students. So today, uh, we have one of these uh, special guests and outstanding scholars. So please me. Uh, in welcoming again Professor Muhammad Yunus, recipient of the Nobel, Prize, P Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his pioneering work on the concepts of microcredit and microfinance. Professor Yunus, <laughs> welcome at Kafoskari. As you see, we have filled the place. This, this, this is unusual. He will be uh, with us tonight and uh, present us with his Lectio Magistralis on a world, a world of three zeros, the near economics of zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero net carbon emissions. With that Lectio Magistralis, we will also welcome Professor Yunus within uh, the, the community of Kafoskari, awarding him uh, the award of Honorary Fellow of Kafoskari. So before leaving the floor to Professor Bagnoli for his laudatio, let me just say one word about the topic, which I found just uh, wonderful as a choice, and the title, a splendid synthesis of what took 17 items uh, to spell out the agenda, the 2030 agenda in the UN nation uh, for sustainable development. So the three zeros seem a perfect synthesis of that, so thanks for that. That's if, if there's need to be, uh, you know, to be certain, uh, is that uh, Nobel Prizes are awarded not by mistake. So, thanks to Fondazione Venezia and to the Bowers for supporting us with the, the initiative, the whole school, and this event in, in particular. And thanks to all who have, been, uh, uh, who have made this event possible. Among them, uh, I understand Carlo Brugnoli has had a special role, Carlo Bagnoli, Stefano Campostini, who will be chairing uh, the panel. And thanks to the team and the staff uh, that helps us with the celebrations and all these events in Kafoskari and in Fondazione Kafoskari. So thank you all for joining us the event. Carlo, the floor is yours.
Professor Yunus uh, graduate in economic at uh, Chittagong University, I hope the pronunciation is correct, in Pakistan. After teaching economics at Chittagong University from uh, 1961 to 1965, Professor Yunus won a Fulbright scholarship. He studied at TO at uh, Vanderbilt University from 1965 to 1972, earning a PhD in economics in 1969. He returned to Chittagong University as head of the economic department in 1972. When Bangladesh suffered a famine in 1974, Professor Yunus felt that he had to do something more for the poor beyond simply teaching. He decided to give long-term loans to people who wanted to start their own small enterprises. This initiative was extended on a large scale through Grameen Bank. In 2006, Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank were jointly awarded Nobel Peace Prize for their work to create economic and social development from below. Grameen Bank's objective since its establishment in 1983 has been to grant small loans to poor people possessing no collateral, so-called microcredit. According to Professor Yunus, uh, poverty means uh, being deprived of all human value. He regards microcredit both as a human right and as an effective means of emerging from poverty. Professor Yunus states, people are not poor for stupidity or laziness. They work the whole day performing complex physical tasks. They, they are poor because the financial institutions of our country are not willing to help them extend their economic basis. It is not a matter of people, it is a matter of structures. Every person is extremely important. Each of us has an unlimited potential and can influence other people's lives within community and countries, during and beyond their own existence. Professor Yunus is the father of both microcredit and social business. The main idea of social business is that it is a such, a such type of business when the investor do not get any dividend from the business beyond their initial investment amount. Provided that the investment is made in a profitable project, and it must yield to profit. The profit that overcomes the initial investment is used to extend the business that will address social problems. Professor Yunus is the founder of Grameen Bank, but also of more than 50 other companies in Bangladesh. The Fortune magazine named Professor Yunus in March 2000, 2012 as one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time. As a professor of economy aziendale, I would, like, I, would like, uh, I would also like to remind the Nobin Udiokta yes? okay. program, which means uh, new entrepreneurs. Through equity financing, this program helps young people to launch their startup, which not necessarily have to be social business. Moreover, I would like to stress Professor Yunus' achievement of having solved, from my perspective, some fundamental paradoxes that afflict the mainstream economic model because of its basic hypothesis that people are egoist by nature and that the egoism is the only motivation for the human behavior. Nevertheless, Gino Zappa, the father of Economia Aziendale, distanced himself from the Homo economicus hypothesis exactly in this university in 1927. In 1927, he stated that each, each human being, as a company operator, is not driven only by only by utilitarian reasons, in 1827. Altruism is a primary characteristic in mankind peculiar to our nature as a sociable animals. 
So we are very close. The egoism assumption generate centrifugal forces, division, dualities and paradoxes. The first paradoxes counterposes the economic profit and the social responsibility. That is the impossibility of making money by doing good. We should remember that this supposed contraposition has been tackled by some Italian illuminated entrepreneurs like Adriano Olivetti and focusing on Veneto Gaetano Marzotto. Unfortunately, they represent only sporadic and not really recent example. The second paradox counterposes the entrepreneur employer with the employee. According to Professor Yunus, all human beings are potentially entrepreneurs, without exception. Men or women living in a urban or rural environment, rich or poor, the Nobin program roots in the same well-founded belief. In the mainstream economic model, the entrepreneur under the risk the entrepreneur, under the risk he, she, he or she takes on, has the right of exploiting the resources, employees included, in order to maximize the economic profit of the enterprise. So the entrepreneurs exploit employees to create economic profit. Just a small part of the generated economic profit is allocated to give back venture of social responsibility to justify the egoism behavior of the entrepreneur. Part of the profit in social responsibility, but only the part. Therefore, the social responsibility is subordinated to the availability of economic profit, and the give back makes the beneficiary dependent on the benefactor. This process can be displayed by an infinity, where rich people become richer increasing the inequalities between rich and poor people. In the innovative economic model proposed by Professor Yunus and founded on altruism to reduce poverty, the employees becomes a small entrepreneur who can creatively resolve social problems starting from his or her personal need. The employee becomes entrepreneur and create economic profit. The economic, profit is, the economic profit is then completely allocated to social responsibility venture with the aim of transforming more and more employees into entrepreneurs. The process can be displayed by an infinity where poor people become less poor, reduce the inequalities. In the innovative economic model proposed by Professor Yunus, uh, as it is well proved uh, by the Nobin program, the conventional business and the social business can not only coexist, but even could reinforce each other. Probably the most significant example is the foundation, in my perspective, of Gramin Danone Foods. In 2006, Gramin and Danone created a joint venture to produce at affordable prices yogurt integrated with the vitamins, mineral salts, and other essential nutrients to solve the problem of malnutrition of children in the rural Bangladesh. Gramine Danone Food is a social business, so no dividend, but it is easy to imagine the return, also in economic term, obtained by Danone. The combination of the two economic models lead to draw a four-leaf clover, that is, uh, as everyone knows, a lucky charm. But especially, it leads to develop centripetal forces that enable to solve the paradoxes, economic profit versus social responsibility, and the entrepreneurs versus employee, creating a cornerstone that we could, or at least I could define with the slogan, people first, profit follows. Thank you. So now I'm uh, 
thank you, Carlo. It was very uh, well expressed, beautiful. Uh, Laudatio. Um, I'm giving the official motivation for the award of the Honorary of Kafoska, the Honorary Fellowship to Professor Muhammad Yunus uh, for his important contributions to the development of social innovation with regard to the creative management of microcredit. The profound social change he has helped bring about in the effort to forge a more modern and tolerant society characterized by an ever-increasing respect for, wo for women. And uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize he received as a consequence of these activities in 2006. Please. delighted to be invited to the University of Venice. I have been in Italy many times, I've traveled many, many cities here, but somehow I missed out Venice all the time. So this is my first visit to Venice, I'm excited about it, and I felt so wonderful being here at the university and meeting the students and faculty and sharing my thoughts and my work. When I talk about my work, I always mention about Bangladesh. Many people don't know about Bangladesh, you do, but whenever I go to other countries, very few people know what Bangladesh is. So one of the ways I try to describe that Bangladeshi people live between water and land. It's always, uh, we, are the f we are a very flat country S and very close to the sea level. We have 170 million people in the country with a very small land area, 150,000 square kilometers, a fraction of Italy with 170 million people. Almost one-fourth of our country is near the sea level. The average height for this one-fourth of the country, not average, the height is below one meter. So that's the maximum height. So you can imagine where we are. And we are crisscrossed by rivers hundreds and hundreds of rivers all over the country. Beautiful names for each river. And when the flood comes, the whole country goes underwater. It's so one of the way I try to describe, I said, we are amphibian people. We live both in water and land. And I, to make the point clear, I said, when our children grow up, they learn swimming before they learn to walk. Because otherwise you cannot survive in a country with all the time with water. So we have a very special relationship with water. Coming to Venice, I got very excited. This, this I never saw before. <laughs> so all this excitement coming from the train station, I was sending pictures that from train station we go <laughs> straight to the river, it's ocean, I mean water, canal. 
So this is a great experience uh, <clears throat> to share with everybody. Being in a country like that, with a densely populated, immensely populated nation, we became a concentrated area for extreme poverty for many, many years. Why people came to live here in the whole subcontinent of Indian subcontinent? This is the most densely populated area. Historians tell us that it was easy to live, plenty of food to grow, plenty of fish to catch. So fish and rice became our staple. And there was no shortage of it until in very recent years when it became a real serious problem. And this was in 1974. We are hit by a famine, people dying of hunger. I just came back from the United States at that time in 1972 because Bangladesh, after a long struggle, long liberation war, became independent country in 1971, end of 71. I was teaching economics in one of the universities in the USA. As soon as we became independent, I immediately resigned from my job. I said, I'm going home. So I came back right away with excitement. Young people everywhere get excited to see a country going through bloodshed and start a life of its own, the freedom that it brings. So that excited everybody. And everybody was dreaming <clears throat> what a beautiful country we can build now. But I start, as I started teaching, all those dreams turned into nightmares. What you thought will happen to country, actually it happened completely the other way. And instead of getting better, it started sliding down very sharply. In 1974, we were hit by a famine, people dying on the streets in the villages everywhere. Here I was a young teacher, full of enthusiasm about economics, such a beautiful discipline of knowledge. And I was enjoying the teaching of elegant theories of economics. My enthusiasm started going down, seeing the situation outside the classroom. When you see dead bodies on the sidewalks, people dying not because of any disease, simply not having just a small amount of food to eat. And it's a very slow process. People don't die of hunger right away. It inches towards the death. And yesterday you saw the person still alive, Today, when you cross by the same road, you see he's dead. So he became totally disenchanted with the way we teach, with the way we learn. And first I accused myself by saying that I have learned a subject which is totally useless. It has no use for the people who are dying. And I have not learned anything which gives me any additional capability to go and be helpful to other people. Because all the economics that I teach has had nothing to do with the people that I see around me. So I thought I spent all my life in a wrong orientation. And I was very depressed. I was thinking, what do we do now? 
So as I was going through this depression, so gradually I started thinking, maybe I can do something. I may not, my economics may not be useful to anybody, but as a human being, maybe I still have some useful, usefulness left in me. I can still be useful to somebody. So with that idea, I started going to the village just next door to the university campus. Our university is located right in the middle of the villages. It's a very unusual village, uh, university in that way. You have age-old villages all around you. In the middle of it, you have a beautiful campus, newly built. As elegant, as beautiful as any campus anywhere in the world. What a contrast with the misery, with the poverty, with the hunger. All around you, you are an ele elegant, modern institution right in the middle of it. So I thought I must break the barrier between the two. So I started going every day to the village with the hope that maybe today I can find myself useful to somebody. I don't know how, because I never learned how to make myself useful to others. That's not what we teach, that's what we learn in schools. So I have to learn by myself. So I tried in my best way just, just to make myself useful to at least one person a day. And I did a lot of little things. Any day I could do something, some little thing to somebody, I feel so happy that I've, I still have some usefulness in me. Gradually I became very familiar with the village. They know me, I know them, I know by face, by name. I became a familiar person in, for them. I learned a lot. After a few months, I started having a strange feeling. The feeling is, for the first time I know what the people are. In my classroom I never understood what people are. These are some abstract thing in the class, in the book. Today I know the people by name, by their house, by their living conditions and so on. It's very clear to me. And then I realized that maybe for the first time I know I'm learning something. I never learned this before. To me, this is an exercise in a classroom thing. It's not real life. So the village in it became my university. And I became very grateful to them, to the people from whom I learned. I felt they are the, my best professors. They taught me what the life is all about, how they see things, how they think about life, how they struggle through the life. And it gave me another feeling. As long as I was in the university, they taught us how to fly high. The higher you get, more you see. And you feel good, you see so many things. You get a bird's eye view. Like a bird, you see lots of things. And now, I get a completely different kind of eyesight. And I started describing this as a warm side view. A warm, you kind of walk around and see, see things very closely, very clearly. You know all the details. And it makes such a big difference between the bird's eye view and the warm's eye view. In the bird's eye view, you see things which is blurred because you're too far away. 
and you make up things to explain what you see. Most of it, just make up stories because you don't see so clearly. In the worms of you, whatever you see is very clear, very concrete. And that warm side view makes solutions to the problem so much easier. Because from a distance, problems look abstract, complicated. You try to analyze it in a very complicated way. When you come close to people, you see things very simple. Solutions are not the way we think. Solution is right there. Because problems and the solutions live together. <clears throat> these, are not, excuse me. <coughs> these are not two different. These are not two different subjects. They're the same thing. And I keep saying that it's the other side of the same coin. They are integrated into the same thing. When you come close to a problem, you see the solution is so simple. But the further you go away from the problem, the more complicated way you try to analyze it and complicated solutions you come up with because you are too far away. To give example, these are kind of afterthought, after I have gone through this. What I learned from the village, good things, bad things, when bad things keep hitting me again and again, loan sharking in the village. Neighbors lend you a small amount of money, and in exchange of that small amount of money, he tries to grab everything you got to make the rules of the game so one-sided. Because you are helpless, you need it for survival, you need a small amount of money, you are desperate. So you enter into agreement, whatever they say. And it's everywhere in the village. Loan sharks taking away everything from other people, their own neighbors. And he got very agitated how a human being can become so cruel to each other, each other. They live together, but when it comes to grabbing things, they are so merciless. And I keep hearing about st stories, real stories, about what happened to a person after he or she borrowed some money from somebody. How he, he lost everything to the loan shark. The more stories I hear, the more agitated I become. For two reasons, I become agitated. First, I feel totally useless because I have no solution for this. I cannot help them, the victims of the loan sharks. Two, I again feel terrible that in the entire journey to learn economics year after year. There's not even a paragraph, not even a sentence that she taught me how to deal with the loan sharks. But this is a real problem for people. Economics just walks away from it. What kind of economics I have learned that doesn't give me any clue whatsoever? to how to overcome this problem in this little village that I work with. So as I was feeling restless about it, agitated about it, suddenly a thought came. Why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money, people will come to me because I'll make it very simple to them. I'm not going to grab things from them. So that is completely out of the picture. And they'll be safe with me, unlike become the victims. So I thought this would be a good way to 
protect few people from the loan sharks, if they like it. So I started telling people that if you, instead of going to the loan sharks, you can come to me if you need money, I'll give you the money. And as I explained, people couldn't really figure out what I mean. Some even thought that I'm a new loan shark. It's a new style of doing business to grab them, grab their properties and everything. But what desperate ones start coming to me, I give the money. As it opens up, they see no harm is happening to them, more people keep coming. And after they see, you know, I'm genuine, I'm all I was trying to do is to help them. Large number of them started coming to me. And I was feeling very happy. Very happy that I could protect them by giving some loan so that they don't have to go to loan sharks. The simple thing I was saying, you don't have to give me anything else, just return the money whenever you can. Very simple. And they tried me out and I stood up to be true to my words. It became very popular. So large and la larger and larger number of people started coming to me and I was become very happy that look, at least I can protect these people. And as days went by, neighboring villages, people started coming to me. And I was delighted. I was working with my students. I took my students with me to help me to do the, the job. As I was expanding it happily, merrily, I started thinking that soon my money will run out. Run out. There are so many people who want to take money. How do I continue this? I thought about it. So ahead of time, before I completely run out of money, I go to the bank located in the campus, propose to the manager of the bank, why don't you lend the money to the people that I lend money to? These are poor people, extremely poor. Their need is a very small amount of money. You can help them a lot. The manager immediately rejected this. He says, it's not bank's job to lend money to the poor people. I said, what is your job as a bank? He said, we lend money. I said, lend money to whom? Of course, lend money to people who have collateral, who has other money, assets and so on. So I tried to explain that, look, I get the money back, I have no problem. But, but they said, it's not banking. So he was kind to me, he said, why don't you go to our, the top people in the bank, try to see if they can help you, I can't help you. I'm guided by the rule of the bank. You go to the people who make the rule. So I did. I met all the people on the top. They gave me the same explanation, bank cannot lend money to the people. Poor people. Then I started attacking them in a very strong language. I said, banks are created in a very such a strange ways. They are supposed to lend money to people who need the money. But they lend the money to people who already have lots of money. And they don't lend money to people who don't have money. I said, the logical thing would have been the other way. You lend the money first to the people who don't have money. Only after that you go to the people who have money. When I tell the bankers that, they laugh at me. They say, oh, no, that's not banking. In the meantime, I need the money. So ultimate solution I made, I came with a proposition to the bankers, take me as a guarantor 
I'll become your guarantor. Sign every single piece of paper you give me. I take the risk, you give the money. If they don't pay back, I'll pay back. It was not easy. Bankers never heard of such a thing. They thought this is a crazy thing to do, somebody to become a guarantor. They're feeling sorry for me. I said, I'll take it, that's not a problem. It took months for them to decide. But finally they did, and I was very happy that I can continue my program. And I did. But bankers be soon become reluctant, they see it's growing. They are absolutely sure in their mind this thing will collapse. It's just a matter of time. It defies all the norms, all the rules, all, all the sane kind of expectations that you can have. Your expectation is poor people take money, they will buy some food for themselves so that they can feed themselves and not able to pay you back anymore. No matter what you do, money is gone. But the reality is people are paying back. They could not match this too. They thought it's a temporary phenomenon. Seeing the reluctance, I was absolutely furious. I said, forget about these banks. These banks will never work for the poor people. Why don't they create a new bank? Bank for the poor. So I started finding ways how to create a bank. Then I found out it's not easy. Everybody is against it. Government is against it. Central bank is against it. So no way you can find a way. But I didn't give up. I started showing all the results that I have in my hand. I said, this is a needed thing. We must create a bank to do that. I started the whole thing in 1976. After years of struggle, finally in 1983, we got the government permission to become a bank. We were absolutely happy that we finally made it. We created a bank, called it Grameen Bank or Village Bank, to expand this work that I have been doing. And once we became bank, it became so easy for us to do it because money is not a problem anymore. As a bank, we just take the deposit from people and lend the money to the poor people and expand it and expand it. Never look back again. It performed precisely the way we did in early years. As we expand, it still has the same quality. People always warned me, don't try to grow fast because this will collapse very soon. I said, I'll go in my own speed until I hear some bad noises in the system. This not something is creating some problem. If I don't see any problem, I'll keep on expanding my work. I did. Soon we became a nationwide bank. And today we have over 9 million borrowers. Almost all of them are women. When they join Grameen Bank, they're destitute women, hungry, ill health, no real place to live. So these are the people we are lending money. And one question everybody asked, why are you giving money to women? You lend money to poor, I understand, but why women? Women have nothing to do with it. I said, again, that is a misconception sitting from a far distance. If you come close to a woman, she works day and night, but don't get paid for it. Almost bulk of the household activity is done by her. All I was trying to tell them, look, whatever you do, these are all skills that can be used for earning money. These are household skills, making baskets, making food, sewing clothes, 
All you have to do, make more of them. If you need money, we'll give you the money. They loved it. So their household skills became the basis on which they did expand. People ask me, how did you design all the intricate rules and procedures of the bank that it works so well? I have to explain in details in the beginning. Then I realized that it's much easier to explain it the way it happened. I said, whenever I need a rule, a procedure, in a certain situation of banking, I look at the conventional banks, how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just go and do the opposite. And it worked. It became a very simple formula for me. And lucky thing for me was, I never took a course in banking. That's the best thing ever happened to me. So I can do anything I want. I don't have to listen to something screaming in my mind, no, no, you can't do this, you're not supposed to do it in banking. So I don't have a, some screaming voice in my head. I didn't feel that if I do something, my professor will, give me, will flunk me in the subject because I'm doing something completely different. I didn't have to worry about that. I do exactly what I felt is needed to be done. So I draw a conclusion from that. Sometimes not knowing is a blessing. You remain free. And this comes back to me again and again. The advantage of being free. To think afresh. That's why I come back to the young people. Their mind is still fresh before they are contaminated by their education. Then their mind is blocked again, like their predecessors. So I said, this is the time when you can do that. As I said, we do the things opposite. To give you some examples, obviously you understood that the conventional bank go to the rich, we go to the poor. Conventional bank go to men, we go to women. Conventional banks want to do business in the city center. We do the business in the villages. We start our program in the remotest village, most difficult village to reach. That's our starting point. Banks want to do the business where all the businesses are concentrated so that they are all take the advantage of it. We made a rule right from the beginning that people should not come to the bank. Bank should go to the people. So we made it our style of banking. We don't do any work in our office. As a matter of fact, we still used to have notices in our office addressed to the, our staff. If anybody is seen in the office, if any staff is seen in the office, he will be punished. Normally, you're supposed to be in office. If you're not in the office, you're punished. We do the other way. So if you are seen in the office, you'll be punished. You should go out, get out. And now imagine we have nine million borrowers spread in 80,000 villages of Bangladesh in every village you are. So our work is to meet all these nine million borrowers within five days at their doorstep to do, do the business with them. That's what is coming back. So if you understand what it means. Rain, shine, flood, drought, heat, doesn't matter. We must meet all our nine million borrowers at their doorstep within five days to complete our job. 
we have a workforce of about 24,000 doing precisely this work. So this can give you a little bit of idea what Grameen Bank is all about. It's not about lending tiny money. It's reversing the entire banking system. The most important thing that bankers get really scared about, looking at our world, we have no collateral. Right from day one, when I was doing it by on my own, I was not asking for any collateral or anything. Simply, you are so desperate, you needed the money, you are about to go to a loan shark. Instead of going to loan shark, you came to me, asked for the money, I gave you the money. Didn't ask how much you got, how do you pay back, why didn't you sign this paper in case I need to use this paper. In the entire system, there is no collateral. Since there is no collateral, there is no legal papers between the lender and the borrower. Since we don't need any legal papers, we have no lawyers. I think we are the only bank in the whole world which is lawyer free. And we tell the bankers, friends, I said the whole word credit means trust. You took the word credit and built an institution based on distrust. You bring lawyers wherever distrust starts. They show up. And that's why all banks are filled with lawyers to deal with you. Pages and pages and pages of terms and conditions. All in their favor. We got rid of it. That's why micro, the word microcredit became so popular. How can you run a bank without collateral? And it's not a small sum when you talk about huge amount of money every day that you lend out. And luckily, every penny comes back. That's another amazing thing. Bankers still cannot understand why people should pay back. What is the rationale behind that? If you give the money, the rational behavior would be you take the money and never show up again. But that's not what happens in microcredit. The repayment rate over the last 42 years of our work is very close to 100%. And it never faltered. Now people say, well, Bangladesh is a funny country. They do all funny things. Maybe in other countries it will not work. Now it has worked. It has been working in all the countries of the world. No country is an exception. And everywhere you do it, you get the same result. We were invited to do it in the United States. Ten years back in 2008, we started at one branch in New York City, in Jackson Heights. And it's beautiful. Exactly exactly copied everything we do in Bangladesh. Didn't change anything. People say, oh, no, no, in the USA you have to change everything. These are not your village illiterate women who don't know anything. These are New York City dwellers. They are very different. I said, that's what you think. I said, all people are same, no matter where you live. They behave the same way. They react the same way. So with that belief, I went into that. And the Jackson Hyde branch demonstrated that how correct I was. Then there was a demand for more branches in New York City and other cities. We have seven branches in New York City now. And we have branches in, in all, in 13 cities. 
in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Omaha, Nebraska, Charlotte, North Carolina, Boston, Miami, and so many. Right now, we have more than 100,000 borrowers in all these 21 branches. All women, 100% women. A startup loan is under $1,500. Can you imagine in the United States, people are working so hard to qualify themselves to get that $1,500 loan? And how desperate they are to have access to that. And over time, in the last 10 years, we have given more than a billion dollars in loans to all these 100,000 borrowers. And repayment is over 99.5% average. Most of the branches are 100%. So again, there is no collateral, nothing. And still you get your money back. And each branch is sustain, financially sustainable. It covers all its cost. It's not a charity based. Now, Grameen America is planning for the next 10 years. Their plan is to expand from 21 branches to 40 branches in the next 10 years, adding another 19 branches. And if you do that, in the 10 years, the total loan that will be given will be $11 billion. Same size, tiny, tiny size. So what it took us 10 years to build $1 billion business. In the next 10 years, it will not be $1 billion in 10 years. It will be a billion dollar per year. So within 10 years, we'll have $11 billion. And we could do much more than that, provided we have a banking license. We don't have a banking license. We try to explain to people, financial services is like economic oxygen to people. If you don't have oxygen in the room like this, we cannot breathe, we cannot function, we collapse. Similarly, if you don't have economic oxygen for people, they cannot function economically. They collapse, they become dysfunctional, and we call them poor people. The moment you connect them with the financial oxygen, they become alive, active, creative. But that thing is not available to the almost half the population of the entire world. Banking system doesn't work for them. That's the kind of economics we learn, the economics we teach, economics we practice. It goes on and on and on. It never changes. I try to explain why there is poverty. And seeing the poor people again and again, I have come to a conclusion and I stand by it. I said poverty is not created by the poor people. It's not their creation. Poverty is created by the system that we built. And universities are part of it where we build the systems. And that's a faulty system, which doesn't create institutions to address the problems that exist. In the, in the past, they used to say it cannot be done. It's impossible. If you give money to poor people, they will never return the money. Today, you can't say that because it has been proven under all circumstances, the payback, and you cover your cost. That's how you become financially sustainable. But still, all these years of our experience, our demonstrations, our persuasion, 
didn't work. The word microcredit that you hear, globally still it is a footnote in the financial system. It's not a mainstream financial system, part of financial system. So that's what creates poverty. Poverty is created by the system, not by the people themselves. And I try to give a kind of an analogy, saying poor people are like bonsai. You know, the, you take the seed of the tallest tree from the forest and put it in a flower pot and let it grow. It will grow, but it will grow only this big. It doesn't grow further than that. Looks so cute. And we give them a cute name, bonsai. There is nothing wrong with the seed of the tree. The seed is as good as any other seed. But we put it in a flower pot. The seed was never given the space, never given the soil on which to grow. Its demand for soil is much bigger, but you gave only a little soil into flower pot. So it grew only this little bit. I said, poor people are actually bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seed. Their seed is as good as any human being anywhere in the world. Simply society never gave them the space to grow as tall as anybody else. You see rejection after rejection from every angle. So that's a story that try to build it up, draw attention, see if we can redesign the entire financial system which is doable, but we don't do it. It's a matter of choice, not a matter of possibility. As we work with the poor people, we got involved with many other issues, their healthcare issues, their sanitation issues, their housing issues, the energy issues, and so on. And I try to get involved with that. Seeing this happening right in front of you, you cannot just walk away saying that, okay, what can I do? I'm not a government. I never walked away from something by saying that I'm not a government. I said, I'm a person, I can do something. Any person can do that, it's not just a special person. All it needs is a little initiative to get it done. So I started the taking initiative. I created a housing program so that poor people have decent houses. And not as a charity, but as a business, affordable business. Our trick is how to make it affordable to people. At the same time, cover your cost. We are only thing we are concerned about how to cover the cost how to make it so cheap, so easy for people to have. And with that intention, we kept on adding more and more businesses, healthcare. We brought healthcare to people, set up clinics in the villages, self-financed, it covered its cost. Hospitals cover its cost, but run as a business. Why did I do all this thing as a business? That is a curiosity everybody has. Why do I go into running business when we talk about poor people? Poor people and business somehow don't go together. What is it that it goes together with poor people? Charity. If you want to help poor people, you give charity. Give them free houses, free water, because water is another thing which is hard to get clean water, safe water. And I always avoid the road towards charity. For simple explanation for myself, I thought charity is a wonderful thing. It helps the poor people. That's how poor people survived on this planet. But 
charity has a limitation. The ch when you do charity, charity money goes out, does a very good thing for people, but the money doesn't come back. I thought, I don't have enough money to keep on giving money to people. I can only give to few people with my money, that's it. If I wanted to help the people to pay off the loan shark or not to go to the loan shark, as a charity, give you the money, you don't go to the loan shark, I can help few people. But I didn't go that path. I wanted to turn it into a business so that money comes back, so that I can use the money again and again. That's what I did. I started creating business. But people pointing it out, but you, are, you say you are creating a business, but it is not a business. I said, why not? Because you are not taking any profit out of your business. I said, is there a law in Bangladesh that if you don't take profit out of your business, you'll be sent to jail? I don't think there's a law. I don't want to take profit for myself. I want to keep it running the business plowing back the profit. All I can do is to take back the investment that I made. I can take my investment money back, but nothing more than, more than that. Then they say, oh, this is not a business, this is charity. I say, huh, there's a fundamental difference. In charity, the money disappears. So you need fresh money to back it up every time. Here, money comes back. Here I sell things. I sell a service, I sell a product, just like any other business. So since I sell things, cover my cost, I'm a genuine business. Only difference between the conventional business, the business that we learn in our classroom and practice all over the world, is a business which aims at maximization of profit. So there's pursuing the path where you can get best money possible. What I have done, I just took the whole thing away from my mind. Chasing money is not our, my goal. I took the business part of business and used it to solve problems. I do things in a way so that people get the product to solve their problem like housing and water or whatever, with no intention of making money. So what I have done, I have taken away the profit motive, personal profit motive from the business and created a new kind of business. And we started giving a name called social business. And define it by saying it's a non-dividend company to solve a human problem. And every social business we create is devoted to solving a problem. So you see the difference between the conventional business is all run by profit model, personal profit model. Social business is run by solving people's problem with no intention of benefiting personally. In conventional business, everything is for me, nothing for others. In social business, everything is for others. Nothing for me. So it's just to kind of complete the picture. And he got very excited doing that. Created lots of companies. One company I feel very happy about the way it worked. Bringing electricity in the villages. The moment you talk about electricity, you think about government. But the government is not providing any electricity in the villages. It has a hard time providing electricity in the cities. So the villages remain dark after sun goes down. So I created a company called Gramin Shokti or Gramin Energy to bring solar energy in the villages. House by house, individual house. It's not a grid based. It's an independent electricity generating unit, solar home system. Take a solar panel, put a battery, and that does the trick. 
and we worked through it. People loved it. It is so affordable, people don't have to think twice about it. Today we have more than four million homes in Bangladesh, in the rural areas of Bangladesh, run with solar energy. So we started very small, like microcredit, it grew because it's so simple. I didn't create this company to make money for myself. I created, I saw a problem and I think I have a solution. And I worked with it, it was not easy in the beginning, but I found the solution and people loved it. And now other countries are imitating it, following it, it's a very simple thing, bring solar energy. So you're replacing kerosene, which is a fossil fuel, by renewable energy, which is solar energy. And it's a social business because no intention of making money out of the business. That idea spread into other countries. Big corporates became interested in our work. Danone is a famous one. Everybody talks about it. We created a company jointly with Danone as a social business to produce yogurt aimed to address the problem of malnutrition about the children. So children eat it, it's very affordable, very cheap, and they get all the micronutrients which are missing in them because yogurt has them all. When you make a business, a social business, your cost of production goes down. For simple thing. If you want to make money, not only you sell the product, you make it lots of gimmicks around it. Your packaging, your advertising, your how you make it look more than what it is. We don't, in social business, you don't have to play any gimmicks into it. Just a pure, simple thing, facts. This is it, this is what it does. And people start trusting you because you, you have shown that you are not making personal benefit out of it. You are doing it to solve people's problem. So now there are big companies like as, uh, Uniqlo in Japan, Uglena in Japan, who joint ventures, Intel Corporation, America, McCain, Canada, all have joined venture businesses. Many are enthusiastically pursuing their social business because they feel that they can play a role. And this is a way I explain to them. You can continue with your conventional business, but you can create a social business as a subsidiary where you'll, in the, your company document you'll say it will never take any dividend out of this company except for receiving back the equivalent amount of the investment, that's all. So it's a company, regulation will maintain that. Then you are free from your profit making thoughts. Profit making mechanism is a very compulsive force, forced you to do things which you don't feel good about doing, but you do that because you have to make money. The moment you, feel you free, get yourself free from that, you feel absolutely open for that. So that's the direction of the social business. The problem that we face in Bangladesh is a massive unemployment. So many of the children of Grameen families are unemployed. We send them to school, get them good education, we give them education loan. So unlike their parents, they are educated young people. Their parents are all illiterate, cannot read, cannot write. We wanted to make sure illiteracy stops at their parents' generation. It doesn't spill over to the next generation. It has not. But they have education, no job in the country. So they complain about it. And I make a counter complaint to them. Why are you looking for jobs? Who told you to have a job? Did your teacher tell you to have a job? Of course, they cannot answer those questions. Then I tell them, forget about jobs. Job is a wrong idea. It's an obsolete idea. 
It should have gone in the last century. Somehow it survived here. You tell yourself every day that I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. I'm an entrepreneur. And behave like an entrepreneur. When you think like an entrepreneur, you feel tall. Unlike when you feel like a job seeker, you feel small. You are at the mercy of other people. Then they say, well, in the schools they never taught us how to start a business. They teach us history, mathematics, biology, anthropology, everything. But they don't teach us how to start a business. I said, shame on you. You are the children of Grameen borrowers. Your mother took a loan from Grameen Bank some 25 years or 30 years back. And ever since she's taken a loan one after another. Your mother is an illiterate woman. She never crossed the boundary of her village in her life. But when opportunity came, she stood up, mastered the courage to take a loan of $20 or $30 to start a business. And she made it successful, paid back every penny on time with interest and took the second loan and the third loan and continued. That's where you're born. You grew up in that environment. Now you're saying that your school never taught you how to start a business. Did any school teach your mother how to start a business? How come she did it? I said it's a very simple reason. There is a difference between you and your mother. Your mother is a natural human being, uncontaminated by education. And you are an artificial human being. As a natural human being, she acted naturally. She didn't worry about what business is. She knew that this she can do. She didn't have a definition of a business. She knew if she had the money, she can buy a few more chicken and they will lay eggs and she can sell the eggs and she can pay back the money, that's it, and have some money left for her. And that's what she did. And she so, got so excited, she wanted to enlarge it, got into another business, another business, that's what she did. But she cannot read and write. So, you became an artificial human being because you went to school. Your school taught you that you have to work for somebody else. They prepared you to work for somebody else. And some even train you how to appear in a job interview. Yet they're mentally you're pre you are told that if you have a good grade, if you have a good education, you get a good job in a good company. So your entire mindset is about job. So if you want to start your life, as an entrepreneur, go back to your mother, clean up your mind again, be a natural human being, come up with a business idea. When you come up with a business idea, we'll invest in your business. We have created a venture capital fund, a social business venture capital fund, waiting for you to come with your business idea. And then we become your partner. You make it successful, all you have to do, return the money that we gave you. We are social business, we are not interested in taking your profit. We are interested in only getting our money back, so that I can invest in another person like you. In the beginning, they were very scared of venture capital, because venture capital is something where you take all the money that somebody makes to maximize your profit. Here, there's no profit taking at all. So we reverse that concept also. Now thousands and thousands of young people every month come with business ideas. We keep on investing, so they become entrepreneur. The, guy, the young person who never thought he will ever become or she will ever become an entrepreneur, she's no good for business. 
suddenly feels that, well, my friend is doing business, my this friend is doing business, I can do better than that. So you get encouraged and start doing another business. So everybody follows the same path to become, why sit around doing nothing? This is a very strange situation, young people sit there do nothing. You know whose fault is this? The fault of the people who designed that theory called economic theory. You have to have a job, that's a prescription, that's the destiny they have put to you for yourself. And young people said, well, I don't have a job, so I sit idle. I don't have to do anything. I said, someday in future, when young people, in the peop, young students in the classroom will discuss, you know, there was a lot of unemployment in Bangladesh in year 2018 or whatever. And the students will ask each other, what is unemployment? Oh, he didn't have a job. What is a job? Job is you work for somebody. Why do you want to work for somebody? Oh, he didn't find the job for with anybody, so he's sitting idle. Is he sick? Why does he sit idle? Is he incapable physically? Does he know what the world is all about? Does he have a good education? Does he have technology in his hand? Then why is he sitting around? People will find it extremely difficult to understand why an energetic young person, fully prepared for life, sit there and do nothing. What kind of spell we have put in that person? It's almost like Harry Potter story. Some magician put a spell on these young people. They can't move their limbs anymore. Sit there, say we are unemployed. Young people are supposed to be active, creative, and get action. And the society's responsibility is to help it. And I try to explain it by saying all human beings are born as entrepreneurs. Theoreticians gave us the wrong thing into our head to work for somebody. I said the worst thing that working for somebody does, it takes away your creative power. And my position is all human beings are born with unlimited creative capacity. The moment you accept the job, you have to say goodbye to your creative capacity. Job doesn't need your creative capacity. Job is run by instructions, by orders. You follow orders. You don't use your own capability, own thinking at all. That's not your assignment. I said, what a damaging thing we do to young people, young human beings. Take away their creative power in exchange for a mere living. And then I look at the way the economic system behaves. And I get very worried about it. The whole economic system today, as it is designed, as it is practiced, is actually a sucking machine. A machine which sucks up wealth from the bottom, transports it to the top. That's the only way you can describe the economic machine. Continually sucking up and pushing it to the top. Today, 1% of the entire world, only 1%, own 99% of the wealth of the entire world. And this is the outcome of the machine that we built, called economic machine, the capitalist system. Because wealth flows only in one direction. It goes to the top and it becomes a big mushroom of wealth, owned by few people. Eight percent, only eight persons in the world, eight people in the world, today own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire population of the world. Four billion people, half the population. That we call a system. I said, I don't want to call it a system. It is a mockery to take all the wealth and 
passing on to the something. In 99% of the population, only 1% of the wealth. What a beautiful economics we got. So that's the system. If it continues, I say we are in a disaster path. And it, it continues, it becomes speedier and speedier. People get richer and richer, faster and faster. So we are in a disaster path. Bulk of the population who are deprived, who are getting only fraction of fraction of that 1% left for them, they will be extremely unhappy. And that will show up in our politics, in our daily interactions and so on, and it will explode at one time. Because this is not a sustainable system. To wealth go in only one direction. It cannot be sustained. So that's the one that we have to address, how to make it happen. I said, if we accept that social business as a kind of something that we can deal with, if we create social business, suppose just for a thinking process, if we convert all businesses as social business, what will happen to the world? First thing, it will stop the complete completely stop the wealth concentration because we don't take any wealth out of, our, out of our business. So it will stop. So if you can go there, the more social businesses are created, less will be the speed of this wealth concentration because that part doesn't take any wealth for themselves. Imagine the other part. If all of us in the world become entrepreneurs, some imagination, Will there be wealth concentration? No, because all of us are picking wealth ourselves. Today, wealth concentration can happen because we work for them. Who has the concentration of our wealth in their hand? If we didn't work for them, they wouldn't have the wealth they got. They don't work. We work for them. So we are the mercenaries for them. This is the kind of outcome. Should we let this process continue or say, no, no, we have to reduce the speed of the concentration? Reduce not only speed, reverse the process. So the wealth from the mushroom will start flowing down to be shared by everybody else. Can it be possible? Of course it's possible. Nothing is it's beyond human creativity. That's one faith you have to have. If we put our mind into it, it can be done. So this is one area that I'm very worried about. Another area that I worry about again, because of the profit maximization, this problem is created. It's the artificial intelligence. We all get very excited about artificial intelligence. It's coming, and coming in a big way. What it promises that the machines will work better than the human beings. That's the whole theme of artificial intelligence. And if it is coming, people who are already in work will be out of work because the machines will be working better than the human being. So the investors will get the machines to work for them rather than a human being. But they don't have to worry about trade union. They don't have to worry about minimum salary. They don't have to do about weekends. So lots of benefit for them. So they will go for it. The question is, what will happen to the people who are out of jobs? One estimate is now, there are many estimates. One estimate says, in the next 15 years, nearly a billion people who are already in employment will be out of employment. Half a billion people will be out of employment. What do you do with them? People who are promoting artificial intelligence, they say, no, no, this is easy. Machines should work, human beings should enjoy. That's the day is coming. I said, that's a great work. Machines should work and human beings should enjoy. But who will put the food on their table? Somebody has to put the food on the table, otherwise they cannot enjoy anything. The answer is, well, the government will give the universal basic income. Everybody have their universal basic income. Well, I said, well, it may sound good, but to me it appears like we have, after all these years of our glory on this planet as a human being, we come to a stage, we all become beggars. 
who live in the mercy of other people, the charity from other people. I said, I don't want to be part of that society. I want to be a human being, a creative human being, an energetic human being, doing things for myself and also taking care of the rest of the world. That's me, that's a human being. I don't want to change my view of a human being, to remain idle and enjoy and be a beggar in the process. So that's the day is coming. I said, any, I just put it this way, technology can be a blessing. It has been blessing for many, many things for us. Technology can be a curse. If artificial intelligence is moving in the direction of taking employed people out of, out of employment, it is in the direction of a curse. We should not allow it. As a society, as a human being, we should stop the progress of artificial intelligence, which will take away human being from its work that they do and they enjoy. But artificial intelligence have many more uses for the benefit as a blessing, as a healthcare, as an education, many things that we cannot do today can be done very easily by applying the artificial intelligence. So it's a question of what you want to do with the technology. And that's the important thing. And the third point is about the worry about the environment. We have only a very short time left, between 20 or 30, 30 years, because we have to stop the global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040, which is 20 years from today. So we don't have much time. The way we go around as if nothing will happen to us, we'll survive. If you go beyond two degrees Celsius by 2050, it's done, that's a borderline. When you will enter the phase of point of no return, you cannot undo it anything, no matter how much you want to do, you'll be done, finished. So we have between 20 to 30 years of time to make sure this planet exists, otherwise, it will be uninhabitable. And it will be a matter of the next generation or so when the planet will become uninhabitable and it cannot be fixed anymore. But we don't, don't get any concern who created these environmental hazards, global warming. Again, is extreme design of the economic theory that we created, making the business to concentrate on making money for themselves, selfishness, greediness, that's behind it. We forgot that we are a human being. We have selfishness and selflessness too, but we never use the selflessness into business. So once we can undo that, we can unlock that selflessness into business, suddenly things can happen and we can turn around the whole direction that we have. The last point I would like to mention, if we follow the old roads, the old roads that we have created in the past, we'll always reach the old destination. And old destination doesn't look good. It's wealth concentration, global warming, massive unemployment. That's the old road, old, old destination. That's where we're heading for. If you want to get away from that, no poverty, no unemployment, no car net carbon emission. That's a new destination. We have to build new roads. With the old roads, we cannot get there. We have to build new roads. And that's what the university is all is, to build new roads. Thank you very much. So, uh, I think we have time only for two questions. Uh, but first of this, I, I must really thank you.
This has not been a lesson. This is a, has been an inspiring view of the world. And, uh, but I must thank you because you offered us something that uh, is becoming rare. Hope. And definitely, hope is what we need also in our old, rich Europe with a lot of problems and a lot of inequity. Thank you again. Thank you. I can leave my notes. Uh, while I, we will get only two questions, perhaps you can prepare uh, a difficult one, <laughs> because this is an easy audience. Okay. Uh, in uh, two weeks' time, thank uh, also to our regional government, we will have uh, uh, something as 200 uh, entrepreneurs uh, from private uh, profit uh, companies gathered together in our university. And uh, uh, this year, we took the challenge to talk about social innovation and social responsibility. So uh, the big question is, what shall I say to them? <laughs> to convince that uh, social innovation can be something interesting also for a profit company. That's, that's my question. But we, have, we do have time to take another two questions. So please, uh, if you would like to ask a question, do we have microphone or you can... Oh. There are already microphones in. Can, can I quickly go back to your question and sure. respond to it while they are coming with the question? Uh, and that's why I was talking about the selfishness and the selflessness. When I talk about solving people's problem in a business way, I was not saying that that will help your business. I never say that. Because that is a selfish reason. I'm doing it for selfless reason. I don't want to benefit from what I do. We have to disengage ourselves from the selfish motive. Only then we can survive. We have to have both motives. One is selfish motive and the selfless motive. And in selfless motive, I should not try to read something that I benefit somehow in my selfish way. Then it will become a selfish enterprise. I should keep it pure selfless business. Some people try to mix both selfishness and selflessness into the same company saying that you'll, some, your company is doing social thing at the same time make money. That's a combination. That's good, better than exclusively making money. Profit and social. But you have to figure out how much of profit, how much of social. It's, it's good to say mix, but mix means a ratio. So is it 50-50, 50, 50, 50 social, 50 profit, or 1% social and 99% profit? which means you are not doing much saying that. So if you do it completely separate company, which is 100% social, that's what we call a social business. There is no element of profit, personal profit out of that, indirectly or indirectly. So you have to create that so that the reasoning of profit doesn't pollute, does not contaminate that logic of the social. That's, we have to keep it separate. And that's, that's the best way to do it for everybody. Why the big companies will do it? Why Danone does it? Why McCain does it? Because they have selflessness in them. So it's just, we have to take it as it is, that they are doing it because they want to be selfless. They want to express themselves, their capacity in a selfless way. Not because they want to do, benefit the company that run. That's not the intention. That way I will feel is the right way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will try to deliver the message. Uh, any question? Oh. Professor Bugliesi. Uh, it's a matter of technology. Okay. <coughs> yeah, it's coming. Uh, yes, I have one question. Actually, you partially uh, answered it already. One comment. Yeah. As a computer scientist, uh, I'd like, you know, a remark, which is that artificial intelligence, if it, it's probably going to cancel, uh, well, or, or you know, have impact on, 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 employ, on employment, but if it will cancel anything, it will cancel the jobs. It will not, uh, you know, it's, it's completely dual to, to creativity. So it will cancel the jobs that, that at some point you described as a sort of a slavery. Yeah. 
and it'll, it'll be substituting people doing you know work that probably people won't uh, be happy to be doing and it will leave full room to uh, to the creativity of the self employment that you have been referring to this is my my a humble uh, uh, opinion on that, and and the progress I doubt it can be stopped. It can be certainly directed towards the, the, the good instead of the bad. But my question is: so, do you really think that? I mean, this is a wonderful model you have. Uh, the question is: uh, to what extent do you think it scales uh, to a full blown? Because you have to take into account that you know some people else are. I mean. A lot of people are, tend to be selfish, and you know to what extent you can count on the money coming back, uh, no, and no risk, and, and so on and so forth. So mm. certainly, I see this is a wonderful model, but you know maybe and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, your view is of course uh, int uh, important. Um, to what extent this can be can become you know. Uh, a full-blown model and, and cancel or, or put to as a residual the, the model that we have now. Yeah. We, we are in the right place to discuss this. We are in the university education system. Imagine the child born in a family today, parents telling them as they grow up that in your life you have two choices. You can work for somebody or you can be an entrepreneur. So think about what you want to be. The day he or she comes to school, they teach there are two options in life. You can be a job seeker, you can work for somebody, or you can be an entrepreneur by yourself. So you have two tracks in our school. You can see which track you want to take. Is your entrepreneur track or your job seeking track? And you can switch in between if you want to fed up with the one that you didn't like, you switch to this, but you have choice. Today, that choice doesn't exist. So we think this is the only thing. We cannot think differently, because ever since we are born, we are telling you have to get, a, get ready to get a good job, so that you can have a good retirement and enjoy your life. That's about it. So bring that. And at the same time, we, in the school, in the homes, in families, we discuss, when you go into business, either as a business, as a job seeker, or as an entrepreneur, remember there are two kinds of businesses. Business to solve people's problems, see what the problems are. You can solve all these problems. You don't have to go and scream on the street, that's the only thing you do, because force the government to do it. You do that, you force the government to do what they're supposed to do, but you can do it yourself. At the same time, each human being transformed the whole world, just one single person. You don't need the whole, everybody to gather together to make it happen. All it needs is a seed. To give an example, is it a, too much of a task to take five unemployed young people out of unemployment by creating a business? Does it need 10 minutes of thinking? It doesn't. I can create a simple business to take five unemployed young people out of unemployment and that fact that I earn enough money to cover all the cost, it doesn't cost me anything, I get my money back. That's what the social business is. But we don't do that, we don't think that way, that I can take five, I said five, can you, t we can take one unemployed young person out of unemployment myself, anybody can do that here. But we don't do that, because that's not what we teach in our schools. We said government has to have a policy to do that, all unemployed. Forget about the all. We can do it one, we can do it two. If I can do it for two unemployed young people out of unemployment, I have solved the problem of unemployment for the whole world because I have shown the way how to do it. That's why I was giving elaborately what microcredit was. It was not a big plan, only to protect few women or men in the village from the loan shark. And the solution is, I give the money myself. Forget it. I didn't do the research project, five-year research project to understand the operation of loan shark in the village of Bangladesh, and if X amount of money invested and have a journal article out of it. I didn't go that way. I simply said, I can do something. <clears throat> if each one of us can do something, as simple, as little as this one, if we can do that, you change the whole world, because that's the step will be repeated over time again and again, and the whole problem will disappear. So that's the one that I've taken. It's a question of creating that environment. An education system is very much a part of it. Today, education system is saying, we are creating job-ready young people. 
I said, that's not a good thing to say. Why should we prepare job-ready young people? Are there some kind of mold that we prepare and put in the machine that they didn't run? I said, we should be preparing life-ready young people to take the whole life together. That's what we are producing. That's the challenge of education system, not job-ready people. So this ori the orientation of everything has to be done. Only then we can see the world in a different way. Otherwise, we are stuck with the one that we have. Thank you very much. We can take a, a last question for an alumnus okay. and entrepreneur. Okay. Please. Thank you. Um, recently, the new government okay. in Italy has introduced uh, new measures uh, for the late uh, and fight the poverty. And uh, it's called uh, uh, citizen's income. That means that they give uh, around 800 uh, euros a month for the people that don't get salary. I just uh, wondering uh, what you think about it. Well, ever since I came to Italy, I've been uh, being asked this question by the journalist. <laughs> it's very popular. Very popular <laughs> question. <laughs> As you can. And, and I have been saying the things in, a, in my way for many, many years. I said, that's the wrong way to put people, even today presentation, I said, I don't to be, want to be a part of a beggar society. I want to be a human being, a creative human being. That's my destiny as a human being. I want to be creative. I want to solve the problems of the world. And that's what I'm equipped for. And that's what I endeavor. That's what the human life is all about. So you take away that life from a young person to become dependent. Dependence doesn't solve problems. I keep repeating this, I'm saying, charity doesn't solve problem. Charity hides problem. You don't notice it anymore, but it breeds. I have been, I have been in, this biz, in this work for many years. When I was talking about it, I was in uh, uh, Glasgow in uh, England. Uh, after a speech, this university says, we are trying to get this uh, people, young people in welfare, out of welfare, to see if they will get a business, they will work on something else. And I said, well, you have young people in welfare? He said, yeah, because here in Glasgow, we have now seventh generation of welfare people. It started seventh generation back, and their children got into welfare, their children got into welfare, now we have seventh generation welfare, never got out of it. And we are trying to get them out, they don't, we get them good job after training and so on. They stay there for a month or so, then leave. This is why you work. We enjoy ourselves, not doing anything. Be on the side. I said, you have damaged the person. You have, you have put in a system where it's crippled that person mentally. It cannot function anymore. I said, I don't want to destroy the human capacity. I want to encourage the human capacity. So my procedure would be how to turn the unemployed young people into entrepreneurs rather than put them into a charity mode. That's, that's what I, 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 that's what human beings are. We should respect what a human being is and help to become a real human being, to unleash the energy, unleash the creative capacity each human being has. System doesn't do that. System blocks that power. That's what my complaint is. System is not conducive to unleashing their capacity. That's why I'm against jobs. Jobs takes away that. I said, not only I'm against charity, I'm also against job. I said, human beings are basically entrepreneurs. And I tried to explain by saying, when we're in the caves, past in the history, we're not sending job application to anybody. Job application from cave number five to cave number 10, do you have a job for me? We didn't do that. We just went ahead and did our own thing, find our food, be hunters, be gatherers, be problem solvers, be farmers. That's what our tradition is. Somebody along the line come the idea that no, we have to work for somebody else. It's a very recent phenomenon, maybe a couple of centuries. Until then, millions of years, we didn't work for anybody. We were slaves, but that's a power game. But never worked for somebody by intention that I want to work for you. We never did that. So we, it's in our blood. Entrepreneurship is in the DNA of human being. But simply our education, our theories has removed that part. Not to come, come into our health consciousness. So we, I'm trying to bring it to, back to the consciousness. You have a choice. You can be an entrepreneur, you can have a job. But we should be aware of the options available to us. That is not available to us today. 
and then we create in financial institutions so that if I want to go into business, finance will come immediately. Here is the money available, and it's very convenient for you. We'll help you. Let's go ahead. That's why I mentioned the venture capital fund as a partnership. It's not something we threatened as a loan. It's not a loan. If you don't pay back, I take everything from you, nothing. It's a business, partnership business. It fails, it's our business fail. You are as much, I am as much responsible as you are. So I cannot blame you for the failure. So that's how it should be. So that the young people feel that yes, I'm completely in good situation where I can explore my life. That exploration part has to be built into the system. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, let me say that uh, I'm really proud of uh, working for university as a, that uh, want to have people like you as honorary fellow. So, uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Yunus. Thank you, entrepreneur Yunus. <laughs> thank you, banker Yunus. <laughs> and thank you, Mohamed, friends of the people at the village. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the